The home stretch. Constructive trust, resulting trust, and declaratory judgments. Uh, sort of a little bit of a bunch of things, and also some of the um, idea, as you start to uh, see it, about um, the religious involvement within um, the courts, what cases can, can actually go there and how that works, um, and whether, and it becomes a subject matter jurisdiction question, um, whether the courts even have the ability to hear uh, what we'll call generically, quote, church disputes. Um, so it becomes an interesting problem because um, there will be some cases that, uh, because it deals with church matters, that the civil courts, uh, because of the First Amendment, uh, will not be authorized to hear. So that's something to start to think about. We've got a couple cases to look at in that regard. But our first case that deals a little bit with constructive trust and resulting trust, and I think some um, ethical issues as well as the Sanguinetti versus Nantucket construction case. It also again raises some issues about equitable defenses that you should be uh, familiar with um, and not just familiar with but well versed in because there's a lot of issues obviously in these cases about well it's not just what the plaintiff's case is about sometimes the defendant uh, wants to make sure that they have the ability to defend themselves as well. Um, and so this was a declaratory judgment action. Um, and we've talked before about a declaratory judgment action. That's where a party brings suit, uh, asking the court to determine what the rights and obligations of the parties are to a real or threatened controversy. We talked about that when we looked at it earlier in time, that there's a, a, a relatively small window between when there's an actual controversy such that the court can adjudicate it by declaratory judgment, and when you've waited too long such that a declaratory judgment would be improper now, and uh, the action should be uh, an action in law or some other action in order to resolve it. Um, so I'm assuming, obviously, that you've looked at the case carefully. Uh, and, I, and I think it's an interesting one um, because if you go through the facts, um, there's some odd circumstances going on. And I guess the, the biggest, uh, or the first question, I should say, not the biggest, but the first question I, I have for you um, is, it, it says that Latches, the uh, Mrs. Sanguinetti, the wife, uh, wants to raise the issue of Latches. So, what is Latches? Unreasonable delay. Say what? Unreasonable delay. That's all. That causes prejudice to the other side. So you knew it all. You just were trying to hold it a little back. So you gave me your <laughs> C answer before you did, before you decided to give me the right answer. It's an unreasonable delay in asserting your rights that causes prejudice to the other side. So what, uh, why, would, why is the plaintiff arguing there's been some unreasonable delay and that that delay has caused prejudice? In this case, what is the delay and what's the prejudice? Alleged prejudice. Well, but statute of limitations is, is, a, is, is a different uh, issue than Lanchi's. Uh, oftentimes, Lanchi's, it still could be within the statute of limitations, but because there are other factors that it becomes problematic. Say when Eddie's dead, the husband. So what is that, how does that... Um, you can you be a key witness for her. Right? And with him not being able to testify, that would be the prejudice that she's talking about. Yeah, see, I think this is, this is much closer to me to a classic case of uh, the type of thing you would you would legitimately have a strong claim of latches with. H how long did she delay in asserting their rights? Like, uh, or did the, the plaintiff? How long? When was the issue first brought to light to the plaintiff's attention, such that the plaintiffs could have, should have, I would have acted on. Um, 
uh, out of concern for what might have been taking place. Right, but so when would the, pl uh, my question right now is when would the, did the plaintiff have the first, when was there any indication that uh, something might have been amiss with respect to this piece of property such that the uh, Nantucket construction uh, was, could have been on notice such that that they should have done something more? It was um, after his death, that's when they became suspicious. So it was after they had received that eviction notice of 1970. That's the key argument. Okay, but wait a minute, but wait a minute though. If it's after the death, then there really can, there would be no claim of Lanchies, right? So it's not, because at least as I heard that, I think in part they were saying, well, you, you delayed asserting these rights until he died, and now we are seriously prejudiced because uh, be, uh, well, Pat's point, and I don't think anyone could quibble with it. Mr. Sanguinetti would be a key witness in this case, right? Yes. Uh, maybe he has information that uh, would make some sense of this. Is that possible, though? I mean, did, did Sanguinetti act appropriately here? Oh, sure. <laughs> sure, sure and no. Well, why, why, what, did he do, what do you think he did wrong that you as uh, the lawyer will avoid when you leave here and practice law? Falsifying a trust and attaching it to a deed. Falsifying a trust, <laughs> attaching it to a deed. Well, that's alleged, and, and my guess is he might have some other account of that transaction. Um, uh, on my the original page 233, my page 290 in the packet, but I don't think you guys are using the packet, so it's original page 233, it says uh, Sanguinetti acted as attorney for all of the parties. That would seem to be problematic, right? I mean, the buyer, the seller. Um, Roundsville prevailed upon a friend, one folks, to grant a loan of 30000 to NCC. Uh, they left the terms of the loan to Sanguinetti, so he's like the banker and the, the broker. Um, and then the document preparer, and he acted as attorney for both the lender and the borrower and the person that put him online. I mean, yo, right? It, he's clearly not protecting his back here, even assuming uh, that, that, they, that he didn't do anything intentionally unethical. Um, he, he's exposed himself here uh, pretty good. Um, what about this falsification of trust? He had keys to the registry, so he could come and go as he wanted. Um, and, and as you read that information about this trust and how it was stamped, I mean, it does, there's pretty uh, strong, significant evidence that something funny was taking place. But again, you know, I worry a little bit about, but that's what makes him such a key witness. Maybe there is an explanation for this. I, I'm not sure what it could possibly be. Um, but, but I mean, <laughs> Or is this just bad? Because of the informal operation of the local registry deed, Sanguinetti had free access to it, even at hours on, on days when the registry was closed. He had a key to the door of the registry and a combination to the safe, which contained all registered documents. Well, so is that what it is? He just put himself in a position where the, you can't, we can't possibly defend it because of the many, many flaws in, in both the process and his behavior? Or, go ahead. It's, I mean, it's obviously a conflict of interest, so I don't know if he was a town selectman or something or what, but if he, had, if he was deal, buying and dealing and selling the property and had access to the records, that's a, a massive conflict of 
public trust and public interest. Well, let me ask you about that because I've done uh, business with a, a lot of smaller towns too. Um, in, in every small town, there's someone who's, so we'll use the generic, the man. It could be a woman these days, but who's the man, right? You want something done in that town, you hire X. So I'm wondering, do you hire X or do you say, no, I don't do business that way? Or I, I was down in Plymouth one 3rd of July. 3rd of July in Plymouth is a big, big um, holiday. Bonfires all along the beach. Great, great, great celebration. And this fairly well-to-do guy up the street took me in. He, had wanted to, he just wanted to show off, in my opinion, because he knew I was a lawyer involved in a case on the waterfront. He wanted to show me that at like 9.30 on the 3rd of July, he can call someone on the planning board, and they pick, take his call and talk to him so that he's going to get accomplished whatever he wants because that's how hardwired he is. Um, You, I mean, I, I was opposing whatever it was that was going on, but I think it was just trying to show me you can F with them down the street, but don't mess with me. Um, I'm wondering, if some, do some of you want to be the man in town, or you're not going to use, you don't want to be the man? None of you? None of you want to have that type of juice that you say it goes, it goes, you say it doesn't, it doesn't? None of you want to be able to do that for your clients? I, none of you have any interest in public service, even for public service? <coughs> Come on. Don't do it. You're just holding back on me? I mean, I don't believe Gary at all doesn't have any interest in, <laughs> in a bigger platform. Not but not, none of you? None of you want to serve your communities maybe in, in a better way. I mean, I'm, I'm looking. Way, yeah. Okay, what I, what, okay. Not uh, listen, what I would suggest, I don't know whether that person ever did anything illegal. I think what he was trying to show me is the, the scope, the, the breadth of his influence. Um, but um, obviously, I had my questions about <laughs> whether things had been done improperly there in, that, in his regard. Um, so, so, I, so now I'm hearing, I think, that we, I would like to be that person, but I'm going to do everything properly. So when you serve on your, as a board of select person, you're not going to, I guess, do any legal business in that town. Is that what you mean? Or you serve on your planning board in a volunteer capacity, you, you're going to put a sign up on the front of window of your law office uh, with a big builders and an X right through it like that. Is that, is that the plan? Because otherwise it seems fraught with potential problems, hopefully not as egregious as Sanguinetti, but it's a slippery slope, isn't it? It happens all the time, but it, you're allowed to legally, I don't know about Massachusetts and New Hampshire, you can sit in office and, and but the conflicts of interest are there. I mean, there's people that are in a state representative position that work for their cities and towns, like firemen and policemen, so they're voting on money for their own salaries. So it's, it's well, but they usually, just in fairness, we had a select person in our town, not Andover, who was on the police. But uh, don't worry, any time a police vote came out, he didn't participate whatsoever uh, yeah. in that vote. Uh, and I'm sure there was never any discussion prior to a post to try and influence that vote in his colleagues that he sat with on a regular basis in any way, because that would be wrong. Um, and I'm sure you used to have a law that said that if, you're, if you work as a public official, you can't be in public office, elected office, and they got rid of the law. That's what scares me. Well, but, but, the other way. but I guess some of, you, some of you already live in small towns. So are you going to practice there? You're going to serve on some of these, in some of these? Towns are always looking for people to assist with different volunteer positions. If it happens to benefit your law office, that's, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a bad thing, is it? Sandy's nodding her head. Yeah, I could see that. No? See that? Okay, but, I think it's a bad thing. but you don't think it's a bad thing? No. Well, how, uh, well, then how do you guard against some of this? I mean, because honestly, you know, my office was in Boston for many years. We, we, we had to know who had the juice in town. Right? Now, oftentimes, if we were coming in from out of town and someone was in town, you knew they knew they already got the guy with the juice. Or the girl with the juice. But it just, <laughs> gener it's generic, just so we know. No, it sounds better. <laughs> it does. Um, 
So, so I'm just trying to figure out how you don't become Sanguinetti, because we look at this now, he's dead. And everyone says, oh, this is terrible. Right, it really is terrible, isn't it? How you don't become him, you just choose not to. What do you mean? Well, what, I wonder when you say you choose not to, you think, do you think he saw this? Do you think he really thought he was cheating anyone? It's probably how things have been he done. This is down in the, in the 60s. It's, it's probably been, he, there's probably three attorneys down there, you know? Yeah, I don't think anyone gave him the keys because they thought he was going to cheat. They, they trusted him. He was, the, he was the lawyer in town. But he knew. Know, he I knew. Know, I mean, time. in 68, he said, I own it. He told the guy in his face, I own it. So he knew. Okay, but no, wait a minute, though. I had asked you earlier, and I was looking for the answer about that 68, and uh, uh, I own it, right? Right. Yeah. At that point, yeah. the person that owns it should do something, shouldn't they? Yes. Because this is Pat Slatchy's argument. In 1968, he says, get off my land. I own it, you lost it, you don't own it anymore. And the true owner says, oh well, someone tells you that, and you say, oh well, you don't, you shouldn't have some obligation to act. I mean, we're looking at this case, and I think he, Sanguinetti did a lot of things wrong. But there might have been an explanation if he had a chance to say it. So you're put, what are, you're put on notice. I own the land. Well, you can sit on your butt and do nothing, and that doesn't constitute latches? When he said, I own it, did, wasn't the guy who was living there thought, you know, well, he's going through leukemia, sick, he's probably out of his mind anyway. So. Well, that's, that's a nice rationalization for why you did sat on your butt for years right. after someone said, you don't own your own house anymore. No, 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 right, I mean, and this, no, no, this is latches, right? This is, right. this is the concern, is that we're getting a one-sided view of the world at this point, and Mrs. Sanguinetti is saying, this is an essential witness, because of your delay has been lost to me. And, and I think, you know, and I think it's a good thing, we as lawyers and law students are looking at this saying, yeah, but he did so many wrong things here, how, do you, how can you just look past some of those things? It does look like he falsified the trust. My guess is he'd have a different explanation. It does say he represented everyone. My guess is he'd probably say, no, the buyer was unrepresented, or the borrower was unrepresented. Someone had to be unrepresented. My guess is that would be his explanation, because even you know, right, you're law students. You know you can't represent everyone in a transaction. You know, well, who represented the husband and wife in the divorce? Well, I represented them both. <laughs> Why don't you just <laughs> mail your law license in now, right? Because because there there clearly are conflicts here. Um, so if it, that took place in '68, when was the action actually filed? Uh, it said right there after he felt suspicious when he got the eviction notice from the wife. That's when he sought counsel, and then it goes into quickly saying that the judge found. So that's when he said he was suspicious. It was 1970. So sometime, well, actually, right. Sanguinetti died in June of '70. She then sends the note, uh, says uh, the bugs are mine at the attorney's office. Um, it, uh, dated December 17th was the uh, '70 was the eviction notice, and after receiving that notice. Um, he went and got counsel. So the action really wasn't filed till 71. Three years after first receiving notice that he, he, his title to the property was in question. Geez, that's really not, that doesn't sound like an unreasonable delay. Three years, I own the house, I own the bogs. And you do not, I mean, right, they did nothing other than say, well, he's got, he's having cancer treatments. Um, it could be attributed to that. Uh, that's probably where the problem lies here. That sounds like, I mean, I don't like what he did either. But boy, that sounds kind of weak to me that someone tells you they, they own your yeah. real estate and you do nothing. 
mind, didn't they, after that happened, like two days later, they ran into each other yes. and had a conversation as if nothing had ever happened, no, nothing came right. up? Yeah. Right. Well, it almost sounded like that was his character, that he would flip uh, out. Yeah, and, that's, um, that, that's right. the character. Yeah. It was either that or it was just small time, st small town, everybody knew each other, and maybe everybody was in on the whole game. I don't know. Seemed like it's, there was so, there's so many things that were unreal. You gotta wonder who knew what. Okay, but, but wait a minute though. Let me just because because I, I hear you and 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 you're right that part. But he also sent an eviction notice in December '68, right? So it wasn't just the conversation. He also had an eviction notice saying remove all your stuff, and he told them. Um, the bank to send all notices to him. Uh, and then as, as we just heard, the next day they had a pleasant discussion. Uh, he, he appeared to be his old self. But again, to me, I'm a little worried that, that this is Nantucket Construction's version of the events without any contradiction from Rounds with uh, Sanguinetti because he's dead. Um, And then it says a lease was prepared by Sanguinetti in which Sanguinetti is trustee under the declaration of trust was the lessor and Roundsville was the lessee. Why do I have to lease my own property? And it was executed on the following day. That's why I think they were all in on it together. Maybe they were just damn dumb. Well, the, 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 clients or the clients or the lawyers? The client, and maybe the lawyer just wanted them to stay, um, you know. Well, you know, is that the problem too? Is that the lawyers really in bed with this client here? I mean, we're, we're sort of business partners. We're also, I'm your lawyer. I'm your mortgage broker. I'm your uh, confidant. I'm a business partner. Is is that? Does he just have too many irons in the fire here to be able to distinguish what his role is? That, but I also believe that I don't think that he told um, the NCC guy there, Rensville. I don't think he told him everything he should have told him about his actual ownership or lack thereof. I don't disagree with you on that. So, Go ahead. So I don't think they were all in on it to that level. But I think that uh, NCC and Runsville had to have some, besides latches, I think there was just more culpability here somehow. Just, just, just un too unbelievable. Okay, but let me let, look at, the, I'm just looking at this language here. After December 6, bottom of page 235, after December 6, 68, neither NCC nor Brownsville made any further payments on the mortgage, the taxes, the insurance, or the collateral loan due to the poor financial condition of the corporation. Right. And then, yet, yeah, Well, wait a minute, before we move on, it's pretty inconsistent with being the owner of the property, isn't it? Right, and that's why I'm saying what I said. It's just... How does this guy at NCC know he's getting away with all this stuff? And then, then they renegotiate the deal, and then it's just too good to be true, you know. And then it talks about an NCC never listed a beneficial interest in the locus on its corporate tax returns, on its annual certificates of condition. I mean, see, to me, I, I don't condone what Sanguinetti did. I, I just worry that there's another version of the events out there that we're never going to hear and 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 there's no doubt that there was enough information prior to his death that to me that you should have gone and got a separate attorney but but is that why we're excusing it though because I'm not so sure if this wasn't an attorney we would have readily excuse NCC doing nothing you know the fact is it, you do have a fiduciary relationship with your clients and you can't profit from their failures or their missteps and then continue to represent them and, and not give them that wise counsel. There's, so there's also some assumption here that, that Sanguinetti was giving counsel to, to, to Runsville, telling him to, to do that on his taxes as his client, you know, showing him ways to cheat taxes. No. Well, wait, hold on, hold on, finish. Possibly. I, I don't dispute possibly, but, but we're now attributing an awful lot of, of poor behavior to Sanguinetti, and, and the poor guy doesn't get a chance to say, I never touched his taxes, I don't know anything about it. Are you guys going to do taxes too? Which is okay, but everything that's wrong for NCC and Roundsville, it's all Sanguinetti's fault. And, and I understand that, and maybe 
it's because he, he had his finger in too many pieces. We just can't we can't look at this case and figure out if this guy knew any ethical boundaries, right? And so, so no, but so is that it? And, and is that the lesson you should take from it? You make one mistake or two, maybe we'll give you one. Make two, once you're two, you're out. I think that he knew more than they, and I think he took advantage of that. But I know he's dead and he can't defend himself, but... And he should have known better. Exactly. If he is a counsel. So you know better. An expert. And then he should know better not to do that. So, Unless so, they didn't start, start teaching that part of ethics until after. <laughs> I think what got, what started this is that 6,000, you're trying to get that. So he was always like, I'll cover that. I'll find a way. So that's where he got the trust from everyone else. Well, he took care of everyone. Right. He was the, the small town lawyer who tried to resolve things. I mean, we, we read this case now and say, bad guy. I, I, I'm not convinced he was the bad guy, although his actions indicate a lot of bad behavior. That, that I would have loved to hear his story. And I'm worried that without that story, we're, we're allowing NCC and Roundsville to benefit by their delay. And that's precisely what Latches wasn't supposed to do. But my alternative then, if I go down that road, would say Mrs. Sanguinetti wins, and his hands do look kind of dirty. Right? I mean, it's difficult to excuse everything he did. But, go ahead. So, if, if you want to try to oversimplify this and say what would a good, what we should we do as lawyers in ethics? Yes. Let's take it down to one thing, and that is that conflict of interest thing. Where you know he talks about, I mean, if you just if, if that didn't start it, because that might have snowballed into everything else. Once this guy Sanguinetti figured, I I play by my own rules, I'll bet her off. All I had to do was here, here's a common sense rule: conflict of interest, don't do it. You know. Well, but I guess I'm wondering what that means with respect to your practices, right? So he needs a loan. So he needs a mortgage, and he says, oh, the bank won't give it to me. Well, let, let me see. I I know some people. Let me see if I can find someone for you to make it work for you. I don't want to see you lose your home and have to leave the community. So he assists. You assist. Geez, I can't get the damn building permit from the building inspector. Listen, Joe's a good guy. Let me make a call for you. Just don't break that one rule. No, no, no. Well, you're laughing. Wouldn't you make the call? You can make the call, but not put the mortgage in your name. He put that mortgage in his own so, name. So well, because I, I, at some point I had to put the mortgage in my name because you didn't have any money. Well, okay, so. So, well, wait a minute, though. So, you will make those calls. Make the Mike, call Mike, you know anyone in North Andover you can reach out to on the police department? Uh, my son's got a problem. That's in your client's favor. That's not in your so, 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 that you can do? That's, well, yeah. unless it's. So, that you will do? If I, yeah, I will refer somebody, but not necessarily put stuff in my, my name. Okay, so, so it, Mike, Bob Ford's on the North Andover Planning Board. Can you just call him and see what his his stance would be on a you know a elderly over fifty five development? Sounds legal enough. Why not? Why, why, so so I can reach out to him, and you will reach out to them because you've been in town now long enough that you're a townie, right. and you know everyone. Right. Well, that's what's he doing? So, so, so the line is where then you start, oh, oh, so you're not taking any money, that's what it is. You're not taking any money for all this representation you're doing. Because that's where we get dirty, right? No. So were you paid to talk to Bob Ford? Were you paid to talk to your friend on the North Andover Police Department? No, no, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sully myself with taking money for the work I do. Is that the, that's your plan? That, that's a good plan. We need more clergy. I just I'm wondering, is that where the is that where we fall off the road? Where it's not a favor anymore? I'm doing it as I, I get paid for this. I get paid for my influence, your influence. Because uh, do you think he really started out by saying I'm gonna? And, and it appears to us he cheated his client. Do you really think that that he started out by saying I'm gonna cheat my, cheat the client, or I got to do this? I'm trying to help this. I need a mortgage. You know, I and mean, going to the registry, I'm sure they gave him keys because they thought they could trust him, not because they thought he was going to phony up documents there. It could have started out with him being, you know, being the man in town, 
full of ego. Like he didn't want to disappoint anybody by not being able to come through. But again, you're making it a bad thing. Maybe he was the man no, of town because he wanted thing. to serve his community. Is it, well, by the way, is it, that's why you're going into public service, right? right? That's what you told me. Is no, no, I would do it to go in to serve my community, right? right. But, but after the fact, you were serving yourself as well. But you were anyway, right? I mean, that was it turns out you were getting paid for this. You get paid as a lawyer. So, so you'll never be in business with your client? I want to read you this language as you start to think about it. It says, furthermore, this is 237. Furthermore, Sanguinetti was in a position of trust, right? We all agree to that. You as the lawyer are in a position of trust with your client. But then it says, not only as the treasurer and director of and the attorney for NCC. By the way, a lot of times when you set up a corporation, you, have, you need three officers. Are you one of them? No. Oh, you're not? You're not the clerk? A lot, a lot of times, a lot of attorneys are listed as the clerk because it's sort of a legal function because you need to file the forms annually. Uh, you need to know what information to file with taxes, how to get the forms. You know, putting yourself in there really doesn't hurt that much either, does it, if the client needs some additional work down the road for those corporations? So you're not the clerk? I'm just wondering. Oh, no? Okay, but anyway, it says treasurer and a director. Director just name. We need some directors, right? So you're not going to do any of that stuff. Uh, in such positions, it was incumbent upon Sanguinetti to show that, quote, he fully and faithfully discharged all his duties to his client. Agreed. Not only by refraining from any misrepresentation or concealment of any material fact, but by active diligence to see that his client was fully informed of the nature and effect of the transaction proposed and of his own rights and interests in the subject matter involved. The attorney must see to it that his client is so placed as to be enabled to deal with him at arm's length without being swayed by the relation of trust and confidence which exists between them. Uh, and, and I don't disagree with the language, but hopefully you will get clients that trust and have confidence in you, right? But, but you gotta know but go ahead, you gotta go ahead. You gotta know which one's your client. So if it's the business, that's your client ahead of that individual officer. Can't can't conflict the two, so it's which one's your client, and that and you can't have conflict of interest with your client, whichever it is. You have to decide. You can't have both as your client. You can't have an officer of the business and be an employer for the business. And which only one of them can be your client. You could probably like for example, you could probably represent. And if I remember ethics properly, you could probably have, uh, represent uh, uh, one of the directors in his divorce case, perhaps as long as there's no conflicts going on. But you can't, if, if ever there's a conflict of interest, your client is the one you're loyal to. So if, it's, if you're the lawyer of the business, you have to be loyal to that client first. So Pat starts a small business. It's not, it is okay, but then it doesn't. And he needs a loan of about 25 grand and his line of credit's tapped out and the bank's not lending it to him. And I know if he gets over this next hump, this could be Lights up, gangbusters. <laughs> Can I put them together with another client to get them that twenty-five grand and work it out, work out the loan provisions, and maybe take a little one percent for my own? Yeah. No, nope. uh -huh. you pay two percent at the bank. You pay two percent at the bank. I'm getting, I'm taking one percent origination guy, fee. The other guy is your client. No, you my client. I'm your client. But the other guy isn't. Well, he's been my client in the past. He's not my client on this. <laughs> no, no, but that, but, but frankly, that is that. It, sometimes that's the way it is, isn't it? I mean, you you hope you get someone with enough juice, influence that he can put. Listen, Pat needs twenty five grand, and frankly, he's probably. Let's be honest, he's probably tickled pink that I might be able to put him with someone to get twenty five grand at favorable rates. Whoever's giving you that one percent, you need to tell the other person to get their own counsel. You. So I'm giving you one percent. No. Um, 
Okay, so if you're giving me 1% of the loan, so your net will be uh, 2250. I'm getting 2250. But you're borrowing 25, I'm taking 2500 as my fee for your representation in this case, but it's coming out of the loan. You need to tell your friend giving the loan that he needs to get independent so, counsel. Okay, yeah, he's going to I'm going to send him to, I'm going to send him to uh, Kelly, my friend. I think that's Usually when we have conflicts, I send them to Kelly. No, no, right? You must have friends you trust. I expect Kelly to, to represent her client appropriately, but Kelly and I are long-term friends. I can't represent both. You told me that. The case tells me that. I'm not going to send them to Sandy. She's... <laughs> no, no. Is, is there something wrong with that? No. No? So I can set them up with friendly counsel, and you don't have a problem with that. Because because I thought they were sort of looking for arm's length and and the rest of it. Because we we want to get a deal done here or what? If we bring Sandy in, there's not going to be a deal here. Bring Kelly in, I think we can get this done. So I'll tell you to get independent counsel, and I'll recommend who that independent independent counsel should be. We're all good, right? Listen, I've got another lawyer in town, no. equally as skilled, and I think we can get this whole deal done before the planning board. Pat will get his his loan too sweet, and we're gone. And even that's fishy for you to yeah, recommend the other yeah, person's yeah, counsel. Really so when you say it's fishy, what does that mean? Is it it's fishy, but hey, listen, if it works, it works. Because no, what do you mean by fishy? You said fishy. You didn't say unethical or improper. You said fishy. Like it smells it bad. It, huh? it raises a flag. If you and, and Kelly are in cahoots and you're referring to the... We're not in cahoots. I just, listen, there are, there are lawyers I know that I could work well with, and there are some that I hate. As long as you're referring huh? to the person. Pat's not going to get his loan if you're in the deal, I can tell you that now. I had, I had a lawyer <laughs> who I used to work with called the other day. And honest to God, it's been years. And she starts with the same thing as usual. And my, I, think, I think I'm going to need a lawyer. I'm thinking, oh, I know you're going to. Uh, <laughs> and I hear the story, and it's a story I've heard a million times about oh, the other lawyer is such a jerk. Um, and I'm sure there may be, I, <laughs> there's at least one jerk in the mix, I can tell you. Um, and that, that the likelihood of this thing going south, because if both sides start butting it early, it's, it's going to go bad. I can tell you, I mean, I've seen that, where maybe we can work it out, but, but I know someone's later on going to say, he works with Kelly all the time. He works, they work together on these deals. I can't represent everyone, so you tag along. Just do what you're supposed to do. You represent that client. Well, not we all. I shouldn't say it like that. But as long as Kelly's representing the interests of that client, and she needs to know, she, she can't compromise her own representation yeah, because I'm here. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Okay, so we're good. So I can recommend. You can recommend, and it's up to them to hire. Them. Right. So I'll just put it in writing. There are many attorneys you could choose. Choose um, some I, you know, that might be, that I've found generally are uh, more skilled than others. Uh, but you need independent counsel, VTY, MLC. I say, and I'd hire Kelly. I got a nice letter in the file. So you're good. I, I guess I'm wondering that how all of you with your public service uh, ideals, because I really think he started out on a much better plane. And you know, it is a slippery slope. I do worry. I mean, you know, but I know, you know, you know the select person. You know the people on the planning board. You know the police chief. I used to coach the police chief's son. He's not the police chief anymore. He's gone somewhere else. But so now I get two towns. Right? The one he's gone to, <laughs> the one I'm in. No? So, so but that's okay? Because the small towns, I mean, we've got to be realistic. This is the way it works, right? It's much more... Listen, when I used to come from Boston into these small towns, I might as well have had horns on and a red cape, you know? Oh, he's from Boston, <laughs> you know? Like, I, I had them tell me that in Ipswich. Don't think you're going to come in here and speak real fast and, and horn swoggle us or whatever the hell he said. And I'm in Ipswich. I'm, you know, what, 25 minutes north of Boston? It's not like... It's not like <laughs> you know? Um, so... So, I'm, I'm a little, I mean, I know how to resolve this case, but I'm a little unresolved with respect to your actions that, um, and I know, you're not going to represent all parties, 
Even if they offer you keys to town hall and the registry of deeds, you're not going to take them. Right? That would be wrong. Is that correct? I used to have keys to uh, the town hall, not the town hall, it was the town public works building, whatever it was, some town office building when I was the president of the soccer association. I should have said no. I probably still have it somewhere, but I bet they haven't even changed the lock. Um, is that, no? As long as it doesn't conflict. As long as it doesn't conflict. Well, but see, the only way we know now that it conflicted is after he's dead, people are raising all these red flags saying, do you know what he did? And, the, and he doesn't even get a chance to defend himself. It's here for a constructive trust. It's here for latches. Um, I, listen, I think a good lesson to take is the, one of the ones that you've taken. You make one mistake, people are going to believe you that you made all ten of them. Mm. And so do not slide down that slippery slope. You know, the fact is he represented everyone in the deal and he, he exposed himself to these types of charges. If you're stupid enough to do that, don't expect that people later on aren't going to lie or otherwise act in their own self-interest. And, and, and that's why I would, I would love to hear his story when I read this case, because I will guarantee you it is dramatically different from what we're reading in the case, which at least raises a good issue of laches, but um, not enough to overcome what his many failures are. Um, but especially if you're going to be practicing in small towns, you do need to, and, or, or even outside, because I mean, I've seen that many times, too. If, you know, you hire to work alongside you, the people that have the juice in town. Uh, they'll make the presentation and everything will be just fine. Um, where if you make it, perhaps it's not going to be as fine. Um, that, y you can't, you can't sort of uh, be blind to uh, personal, in people's personal influence. They prefer to deal with people they trust and know. Um, and so, how do you how do you work that without being unethical or improper? Um, the case is also about uh, two. Well, this is shots. As the, the tonight's uh, lessons are a couple of very important legal principles, uh, equitable principles: constructive trust and in, uh, resulting trust. Um, and this is not a trust. Uh, that one would declare by way of uh, a testamentary instrument, a will and trust, uh, or during the lifetime to create a written trust that has specific terms like, by the way, that the trust that he did create, uh, Windswept Realty Trust, which had specific terms in it, um, was filed uh, and recorded. Uh, what the plaintiff's asking for here uh, is the constructive trust be imposed on the property for the benefit of uh, Nantucket construction? Um, to avoid unjust enrichment. It, in order to avoid unjust enrichment, right? We're on the bottom of 236. To avoid unjust enrichment, a constructive trust is imposed um, on behalf of one party um, at, at where the property is obtained at the expense of the other, um, but we've got two conditions in order to have uh, the constructive trust imposed uh, in order to avoid unjust enrichment of one party at the expense of another. Um, if the legal title is obtained, A, by fraud, B, in violation of a fiduciary relationship, or C, where information confidentially given or acquired is used to the advantage of the recipient at the expense of the one who disclosed the information. Um, so, was the property obtained by fraud, B, in violation of a fiduciary relationship, or where information is confidentially given or acquired and then used to the advantage of the recipient at the expense of the one who disclosed the information. Which one do you think it is here? At least B. It's at least B in violation of a fiduciary relationship. Was he in a position of trust yes. um, to Roundsville and NCC? Yeah, there's almost no doubt, uh, and I don't know how you would avoid that argument that. Uh, you as the lawyer stand in a fiduciary relationship on behalf of your client. You are in a position of trust, um, which we do all agree to, right? Your, your client should be able to trust you. 
And therefore, then you have to honor that trust that they, they place in you. And, and, I, and I do think that that's a big problem with this case, is that how, how do we uh, look at this case and say that um, all things considered, they had the ability to trust him when he's got his hands in so many parts of this, this, this process here. I, I would love to hear what he has to say, um, but as the case points out, he's the treasurer and he's a director of and the attorney for NCC. It, frankly, especially back then, it would not be that unusual that the attorney would be listed on the corporate papers as both the clerk and a, and a director. That It was pretty common simply because at one point in time you needed more than one officer for the corporation. And so if Pat came in, would say, well, who else do you have? Pat said, I, I don't have anyone else. Well, okay, I'll be a clerk and a director if you need me. When you have other people, we can take them off. It's, it, it's not as sinister as it looks here. Um, if, you, if you looked at the time, it is a little problematic that he's treasurer. Uh, because that controls the funds and obviously the the BBO and others are always greatly concerned when um, the, there's a fund issue with between you and your client that uh, potentially causes that line to blur um, and then it says since he was in a position of trust it was incumbent upon him to show that he fully and faithfully discharged all his duties to the client, not only by refraining from any misrepresentation or concealment of any material fact, but by active diligence to see that the client was fully informed of the nature and effect of the transaction proposed and of his own rights and interests in the subject matter. The attorney must see to it that his client is so placed as to be enabled to deal with him at arm's length without being swayed by the relation of trust and confidence which exists between them. I got a question on that because Go ahead. I'm thinking even today if you're if you're the lawyer for the company, you're not the client. Here the problem was is he was trying to vote. So that's where if he's the treasurer there's a conflict potentially there. But if the lawyer is just <laughs> like it's a startup company, I'll be your clerk, I'll be the treasurer in an office or director or whatever and I want X amount of profits in your new corporation or whatever the deal, whatever contract you sign as an employee or officer of your company. I'm thinking that's all still okay. As long as, you, as long as you know your client is that company and the company's success is what your fiduciary relationship is for, and that's fiduciary is also financial. And if there's no conflicts in what you do on a daily basis, you should be okay. However, if you start representing one of the other officers in some other capacity that's not consistent with what's in, in the best interest of your client, the company, then you got a problem. And that's what happened well, here. But, uh, uh, but let me take the first part of the problem, uh, first part of the question you posed, because I'm not so sure you're uh, completely out of uh, trouble on the first part. Pat Small Company, uh, some type of tech company, he doesn't have any cash to pay you. But you know, I'm, things are going pretty good for me. I can take I can take stock instead of cash. Can I? Pat wants a corporation formed. He needs some legal work developed uh, with respect to the bylaws and the corporate papers and uh, filing the formation as well. He's thinking, you know, sometime down the road he'd like to go public. I can do all this for twenty percent of the stock in the company. I would hope you'd be able to do that. No, no. as long as it's well, reasonable. Well, 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 now I own a piece of the company, and I represent the company. Or, so what? I cannot do that. Why does it cost? He doesn't have any cash. He won't get a lawyer otherwise. Or, I can do it, but I've got to fully disclose to Pat, and make sure he understands that. In representing the company, um, he might be able to find a lawyer who would do this more cheaply. A, uh, or B, that he'd be able to pay cash for instead of having to give up a quarter of his company. I believe in ethics they said you can't have any rights into the matter of which you're um, doing the, the representation for. That's so right. that if you're representing, you're trying to start up this company, then you should have no stock in that company. No well, he's trying to start up the company, but he doesn't have cash. I'm willing to give him, I'm willing to give him my wisdom and work but it's going to cost him, uh, I'll make it shorter money, 10% of the stock. It has sounds like he's becoming a business deal. It is, right? And so that you, you know, you have, I think it's like four, 
four criteria. Do you, I don't remember exactly. You need to have informed consent writing from the. So full disclosure and informed consent. Full disclosure as to what your role in the transaction is. Um, the whole deal has to be in writing in terms that I understand. Don't you have to be represented also, I think? And yeah, I, um, you have to recommend that I get independent counsel for that. Kelly? Kelly, sure. No, right? <laughs> I'm going to recommend independent counsel. So, so there may be ways to structure it, but we're going to put these protections in place. Listen, here's the part of the problem, and this is what you have to start to think about. He may not, he's not going to be able to get counsel otherwise. He's, his cash is going into the business. And you know what? Things are going pretty well for me. This might work if we can structure it so that later on down the road, I don't have these law students looking at it saying, do you know what he did? He took 20% of Microsoft from, from poor Bill Gates. <laughs> well, I worked, I worked for it in forming the corporation. I provided all that advice throughout. By the way, if I was an employee of the corporation, an in-house counsel, my guess is there'd be no problem with me having warrants and stock options and the like. It's, it's where you're making the outside counsel that we've got to try and deal with and protect. Here's, I think here's the bottom line no matter what. you got to protect your back, period. And not just that if it it works out great. But what if it doesn't work out so well? And people say, well, you know, really, there was a conflict here between their role as a stockholder, which I think at some point there is, isn't there? And your role as advisor to the corporation. Between your role as uh, the, if you're outside counsel, and the, uh, to what extent you've got some level of involvement with the officers uh, in charge of the corporation. You know, after the fact is how people ultimately are going to judge our behavior. And we're sitting here with Roundsville saying, oh my God, look how bad this is. And it is. It's real bad. Okay? No doubt about it. Um, but you've got to think about, well, how do I avoid going forward the, 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 the same type of thing? Um, so that people can say later on, I didn't disclose this. It means more documentation. As Pat says, more disclosure. Um, and not just letters sent, but you know, acknowledgement of having received that information. Sign off on the information that they've given. I provided you uh, 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 recommendation for independent counsel, that there may be other alternatives to be able to do this. You want to go forward with me. I'm only willing to do it on the following terms. Uh, uh, you know, you sought out the counsel, talked to them, and uh, nonetheless you want to go forward. Some of the same disclosures we were talking about when we were worried about some of the surrogacy agreements. It never hurts to use a, a suspenders and belt approach when it's your own professional reputation and license that potentially is going to suffer um, in the event the deal doesn't turn out the way it was. And, and you know, we live in 2013. People don't take responsibility for their own failures. What they do is that they look to others uh, and start pointing the finger. And, and the fact is you want to be careful. You spend too much time listening to me and others in law school and working your tail off to have people be able to, to sully your reputation when you were trying to do the right thing. Um, because as I said to someone earlier today, at least part of what my job as I see in remedies is to, to try and have you start to think about where the boundaries of your own behavior are. Because when you get out there, clients, other lawyers, um, people are going to ask you to do things that, that you shouldn't be doing. And you need to know where you draw the line on that. Um, and, and I think some of it starts with your, not just the ethical rules, but um, your own sense of uh, what is appropriate and inappropriate. Uh, the statute of limitations argument. Um, and they did do a constructive trust in this case because of the violation of the fiduciary relationship, that position of trust. The statute of limitations, uh, they say Roundsville did not have actual knowledge uh, that the beneficiaries of the trust might be persons other than NCC until 1970. And what they also provide for you in this language here, whereas in this case there has been fraudulent concealment. Fraudulent concealment is a defense to the statute of limitations. It's a counter to it. So if the party has kept their improper behavior from you, fraudulently concealed it, then you can use that as a defense to the statute of limitations. Because in essence, 
you couldn't have otherwise found out about it because they fraudulently concealed their illegal actions from you. So Fraudulent concealment tolls the statute of limitations. So however, however long you can show that they fraudulently concealed, that doesn't matter in the statute of limitations. That period comes out of the statute of limitations. If I if I do something to you, but I you say, Mike, uh, you know, what did you do with respect to those proceeds? Oh, I remember I put them in trust for you. I'm holding them for you in safekeeping. You know, like think about Madoff, right? And I give you a statement that says, here it is. See, it's right there. It's all everything's good. Um, and and in essence, what I'm doing is trying to to to, to pacify you. Uh, and appease you so that you won't take steps to find out what's going on. I am concealing my uh, bad behavior from you, and the argument is then that shouldn't count against the statute of limitations, which would normally be running. And it's a it's a very it's a fair operation of the rule. If in, if in fact there's been fraudulent concealment, again I sort of worry you how this is fraudulent concealment when he says I own the land, get off. I send you I send you an eviction notice. But again, that's more of a legal argument than anything else. And here's the problem. I can't excuse all of Sanguinetti's behavior. As, as much as some of it, um, and some of it I think is a very legitimate claim of Lachey's, he's a lawyer. And we expect you as lawyers, this lawyer too, to act with a much higher level of appropriate behavior. And, and if, you, if you sin once, then no one's going to cut you a slack when we start looking at it and saying, okay, it could be this, it could be that. Well, listen, the fact is it could be a lot of things, but you acted improperly here. Um, and they, they argue here that Latches is not, the, the last part of the decision is not a bar. Uh, and I understand uh, why they're going this route. I don't think it's quite the language, I don't think it's quite in accordance with the language that they have here. Uh, there's no lack, the court says, there's no lack of diligence on their part in seeking a remedy. Really? Three years? That's not diligence. Someone, I go home tonight, someone says, Mike, I own your house and, and I can, don't have to do anything? Mm, I, I understand why they want to punish him as a lawyer inappropriately, but I don't agree. I think that's, a, that's an overstatement to say there was no lack of diligence here. Uh, and there's no positive showing that the time element involved in bringing suit operated to prejudice the plaintiff. So we need both. But again, uh, I, I don't quite agree with that logic uh, because I think, I think we're missing a key witness who would provide a very different version of the events. Uh, but that's okay uh, because I think we, we're more concerned about punishing the lawyer and I think the lawyer should be punished. Uh, lastly, it says here, upon motion of the defendants, the judge struck the March 1st, 62 declaration of trust which had been admitted to Benning. What's that mean? What is, what is something that's been admitted to Benning? Hmm. None of you have had evidence in this class? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it should sound familiar. <laughs> what is Domene? Domene, D E, two words, D E, B E N E. Is it to benefit? So what? Oh, you're translating, you're translating the term. But what, what did you say? For good. Or For good. So what's that mean? That, right, that is the, the literal. Latin translation, you and yes, me. I did taught you this. I did teach you this. <laughs> you what is the Benning? Latin was wrong on the board. It is. It, it is because they're not going to test this in multiple choice. <laughs> but what? That it, sentence again. Though. It says, uh, upon motion of the defense, the judge struck the March first sixty-two declaration of trust, which had been admitted to Bene from evidence, as it was not, in fact. Duly recorded, blah, 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 blah. Conditionally, provisionally. Oh, you looked it up, Patrick. Okay. Evidence that's admitted to Bennett. It's a conditional admission of evidence subject to further proof at a later point, further linking up. And so sometimes when the court feels that we haven't laid a sufficient foundation for a piece of evidence, we would ask the court to admit it to Bennett conditionally through this witness upon further foundation from a later witness. If the evidence isn't forthcoming at a later point regarding the balance of whatever the court was interested in, 
then you've got to remember to move to strike the piece of evidence that was admitted to Bennett, that was admitted conditionally. And so the, the, what the court was doing here is because the uh, plaintiff never completed their offer of proof and provided the additional foundation to admit that evidence, they moved to strike it because uh, it shouldn't be allowed to stay in De Bene because they didn't provide the additional information at a later point. And it could be just the witness testifying as to you know chemical analysis, it could be anything. But not we can't always get the entire foundation for the admissibility of a piece of evidence in through a single witness. When you want to use it then to provide some of the foundation and use the piece of evidence, you ask that it be admitted to Bene. Maureen Sullivan versus James Rooney. And this is an action between two unmarried persons who had formerly lived together as, well, as if husband and wife, so she says. Um, she has nothing in writing. And she has nothing in writing. And she now wants the imposition of a constructive trust or resulting trust, probably any type of trust you take, um, in his property. And there's obviously, as Ash has already pointed out, a statute of frauds issue. Uh, because she's had nothing in writing. Um, and her name's not on the property. And again, it's another she question of unjust enrichment as she sees it. She never paid any of the mortgage payments. She never paid a dime of the mortgage payments or the insurance, nothing. Real estate taxes. Real estate taxes, a real freeloader. <laughs> and now she wants now she wants now she wants now she wants half his property. Uh, well, okay, let, let me ask, let me ask the first question. If this was the guy looking for the woman's um, for her property that was in her name, would you have would you have a different answer for me? No. No. So you'd say, no, give him half her property. If he, it, and for me, if, if he decorated and cooked for you and his name yeah. wasn't on the property, yeah. you'd say, oh yeah, career. she should give up what? She left her career and she bought all the food. What was her career? She was a flying waitress. No. I think you're being very paternalistic to um, <laughs> protect the woman here because, oh, well, I'll, I'll ask you because we had this case one time before. Well, actually, I've always read, we've read this case for a number of years. After reading this case one time, I had one of the, your classmates, then classmates, come to me and say, Professor Coyne, is that case for real? And I said, yeah. He said, oh, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> um, and he said, um, I was living with this woman. I gave her $100,000. She wanted to redo the house. For various reasons, my name wasn't on the title or the mortgage or anything else. She redid the house. Now we split up. I went to see a lawyer. He said, nothing you can do. No writing, statute of frauds. You lived in the house for about three years. Would you give him the constructive trust? Because he says, well, I gave her 100000 I can show you. Not a gift. She says gift. She says hey, whatever. She says, okay, gift, call it whatever you want. Call it your rent. But you're not getting any money, and you're not getting a constructive trust. You've got a career. Hit the road, buddy. No palimony. Nothing else. So would, would your answer be the same? There's got to be more than that before you uh -huh. answer for that. Uh, uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna salt the wound a little more, and I'm gonna tell you why there was no documentation that supports it. In my and I'm pretty sure this is accurate. Um, he happened to be going through uh, his own messy divorce at the time, and this so therefore this had to be all sort of off the books. Good, I'm glad I have told you. Bet you are, sunshine. <laughs> so so there was there was no documentation that supports it, and. So, is your decision the same? No, he could seek a constructive trust in the house. He can show it. She provided it. They made these improvements with the expectation that they were partners in this enterprise and someday would uh, continue to live in the house happily ever after forever. So, you're going to impose a constructive trust on her house for that 100000 Is Is that true? 
I think he should get something, but I could see why he didn't do it, and it's because he probably didn't want to put anything in writing because he was probably still married right. and going through a divorce. So he did it to conceal stuff, but still I think he, he deserves a piece of that. Right. And why is that? So, I, no, no, why is, it, why is it a constructive trust? So you just looked at the principles of what creates a constructive trust. Why is that? If it's unjust enrichment based on fraud, what is it? Violation, Violation of fiduciary, fiduciary relationship. Well, so you're in a fiduciary relationship with the, um, your, your boyfriend, girlfriend? It's called prostitution. Are you, it's not fraud, is it? <laughs> so, so are you in a fiduciary relationship with your boyfriend, girlfriend? Yes. You are. It's got to be one of the three, right? Fraud, violation of fiduciary relationship, or you receive a co confidential information that you somehow use to your advantage. Hey, the house up the street's for sale, and it's the widow selling it, and I think we can get a great deal for it. And, and I say, Ash, what do you think? We get the money together? And Ash says, yeah, maybe. He goes and buys the house. Steals my deal from me. That, that would be the last one, right? Yeah. That didn't apply here either. No. It's fiduciary relationship again? Yes. So you in a fiduciary, are, you in a, are you in a fiduciary relationship with your partner? The judge says you, that here. Yeah. Uh, okay, but so you right. are? Yes. Yeah, so Does it matter how long the relationship is? I mean, like, because some of these partners here are, they come and go rather frequently these <laughs> days, you know? Not, no, 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 I'm serious now. Is, is that, think, how long of a partnership does it have to be? I think the three years is certainly long. It's a long time. Okay, okay but I and I don't disagree with you. Three years. So, because because Ash's point was, we seem to be throwing away the statute of frauds here. These people are together for a long time, and he made her an oral promise. So she says. I believe her. I uh, Of course you believe her. <laughs> of course you believe her. You want to give him half the house. You got to believe her to do that. But what happened to the statute of frauds? You're enforcing an oral agreement with respect to real estate because you feel for her. Okay, I, I get it, but it's not a, it's not really legal. Or is she so, to get to constructive trust? She's in a position of trust. They're in a position of trust. She's not married, right? I mean, there's a reason why we have marriages and. People choose not to be married. I know you're saying statute of fraud, but she once they dissolved their relationship, she filed soon after, which was a year she, within. She wanted so a husband because she was a scorned woman. So all along with those fifteen years, she kept relying on his promise, knowing that right. they were still together. She was back. What promise? Him. What was that, the promise? That he would put her on her deed or that he would put her name on the title. It's the 15 years when he doesn't put yeah, your name on the deed or the title. I know. Yeah. So Can't you hear the music here? <laughs> I think we got a commitment problem, frankly. She should have married. That's, that's no, but there, she should. She should. there is a difference between no relationships where a marriage exists and not. I thought that was the whole... But I can see why she continued to rely because she still benefited no. from that. No. So she says. Yes. No. So she says that's why she stayed. Yeah, she's out of there. Well, she won anyway, so. So you, you, yeah. okay, but wait a minute. She won. So, so you would let, we'll call him Mark win. He can go get his $100,000 from this woman he spent three years with and took the money. Half the house. Huh? You should get half well, half the house might be, but frankly, that was during a time where prices were rapidly increasing. So. She says it's a gift. He says, no, it wasn't a gift. Who gives someone $100,000? You know? Are you in uh, love? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 A little cynical about love these days, Cal. If you feel like you, know, you are going to want some money back, then you don't need to give it to begin with. If not, then you better consider it a gift. And if there's no document evidencing a loan, or there's no document evidencing ownership in the real estate, that's the statute of frauds, isn't it? I mean, you guys, how do you guys get around the statute of frauds here? Through the constructive trust, that's it? So you can trust what your partner says, period. Because it's not fraud. Do we agree? Not fraud. Not the third part of this no. trilogy. It's Violation of a fiduciary relationship. It's not like lawyer. So, so you can trust your partner. You should. Why? You're going to call me tomorrow, right? <laughs> I'm just asking. That's the way that works. You can trust that. 
Because because this or is this the this is the duration of the relationship? You said over oh, fifteen years. Well, fifteen years, so a year, six months, a month. People get married after that. Yeah. Or they don't. Mm -hmm. Or they don't. And they take the consequences that go with it. No. I I have to I have to call liar because I don't think if this if the if the genders were reversed here, you would be as easily giving him half this house. Go ahead. The judge I think the judge rationalizes getting past the statute of frauds here by trying to create a fiduciary because in this sentence right here, he says admitting to having made these promises, the judge further found that in. In reliance on these promises, the plaintiff was induced to stay in the relationship. To me, that's like prostitution. You know, it's like you're induced to stay in a relationship for money. That's what it's saying. Well, that, that was the argument in the Lee Marvin case, and that's what the California way where they talked about palimony is that she wants payment for services rendered. That's the next sentence. Contribute her earnings and services. <laughs> give up. And give up. But I know I know I know. I'm talking and pleading and decorating, not necessarily yeah. dead gearing. That's right. So well, she bought furniture, so She's that's trying to make an argument here. Well, but, but uh, okay, she bought furniture to sit in, and she bought food to eat, right. and household supplies. Right. Well, you thought you could live rent free? I mean, Don't you would have paid. Free. What? She's living rent free, is that what you're saying? Pretty much. Well, well, you would have, right? I mean, when you say it says the plaintiff a waitress put all her earnings and savings into the house, which wasn't much, paying for the food and household supplies, you got to eat. He probably wanted steak. I don't know. And much of the furniture, because we agree, right? She didn't pay a dime for the mortgage, or the taxes, or the insurance. She paid none of the bills that would be attendant to the homeowner. No, she just played as maid the whole time. Yeah, what's that mean? Um, she did all the housework, the decorating, and the entertaining of the defendant's colleagues. Right. Well, services. Huh? Really? <laughs> <laughs> That's so you want to pay her as a wife? Without the benefit of the marriage. Sure. The whole well, that's that's palimony. That that we Massachusetts. And this is a mass case. We don't recognize palimony. It says. Right. The judge ruled that the defendant would be unjustly enriched if he were allowed to keep sole title to the house. Really? This is unjust enrichment. He's unjustly enriched because the title's in his name. And she argues there was an old promise that her name would be on the title. Uh, on the way there, he said, yeah, your name's not going to be on the title. He told her. Uh, I'm sympathetic to the case, but really unjustly enriched? The judge ordered the defendant to convey to the plaintiff a half interest in the house. The judge's rulings of law speak of compensation for services and a quantum merit, right? The reasonable value of the services rendered. Even if we were to recognize the plaintiff was entitled to recover the fair value of her services without offsetting the value of her services against the fair value of the defendant's contributions during the relationship, there's no findings nor any evidence uh, warranting such, a reward, such an award. I mean, that's, let's be honest. Judges appears to go out of their way to try and provide her a constructive trust. Go ahead. Is this going to happen if her name was on the financing papers? <clears throat> because he said, you know, I'm going to get a better deal if I do it through the veterans, whatever. And Allegedly. But that's what she says. That's what she's got to say. But couldn't the judge ask for W-2s from her? Or no? To say how much Not the judge, but that's discovery. That's discovery. You know, the judge is writing it to, 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 to recognize that if we're going this route, we've got to overcome a couple of huge barriers. We've got to overcome the, uh, the statute of frauds argument. We've got to overcome that Massachusetts doesn't recognize uh, quantum merit theory in such circumstances because part of it, you can poo-poo it, but part of it is it's, it's a relationship that there is sexual uh, activity with and that's, how, are you going to value that activity? Is that what we're pay, compensating her for now as well? Um, no comment. And um, well, Professor Coyne, unlike the other uh, case we just read, Sanguinetti, he was dead. 
Right. He is alive. So you say so she says. He did not uh, counter any of the uh, evidence saying that he continually promised. So he I, I don't that. know whether that's true, Sunshine. I, I see the language. At, you know, the judge finds that he made these promises. I, I'd like to see him actually say that. I have a hard time believing he said, yeah, 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 I promised to that. Yeah. But, I, but I didn't intend it. But, but wait a minute, though. So you are in a fiduciary relationship with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You do uh, are in a position of trust, and you can trust them. Because the, the judge had to make, and it says, unchallenged findings. So Rooney doesn't challenge it, that there was a fiduciary relationship between the parties. I don't know. Is, is that truly, is that a position of trust, a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship? It should be. It should be. Okay, I know you say should be. Is it? Is my question. Together, I yes. Say, yeah. If they live together, it is. Yeah. Regardless of how long they live together for. They're sharing bills or whatever. So, any of you have roommates? I mean, not not uh, roommates of the same gender, even. You have a roommate of the same gender. So is he in a fiduciary relationship with that whoever that is that he shares bills with? <laughs> no, he it, offers services. I don't oh, know. Oh, <laughs> No, no, but wait, no, wait, I'm, I'm serious. Uh, are you? <laughs> okay, so are, are you, you the person you share your bills with? Um, you're in a position of trust too? Yes. Are you just roommates? We're just roommates, strictly. So, 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 wait, so wait a minute, is that different? Because it doesn't have to be, the, the, I, I made it same gender, it doesn't make a difference really what the gender is, because you, you're now telling me if they share bills, they're in a position of trust. I think so. You don't have to be the same sex. You share. can be the same sex. Okay, but you know this is Kelly's house. Yes. Now, so now that person, even without, without any further relationship, could have a claim to Kelly's house on a constructive trust because no, they're in a fiduciary. No. I'm just saying that if Kelly gets into an agreement with her uh, roommate, to do some financial thing that, yeah, then... Well, but, wait, you, but, but most of your roommates, my guess is, those of you that have roommates, we're going to share the cable bill, we're going to share the oil bill, whatever it is. I mean, you're this some, we're going to share the rent. The rent. So, 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 so oh, we'll share the mortgage. Is that all it takes? To create a fiduciary duty. It, is it? Yes. I think so. So then that roommate, even a roommate who we're not, like, close, like, real close, like here, too, that roommate can make a claim against my house? In violation of the statute of frauds? I mean, I can see why you're going here. A 15-year relationship is a long relationship. Well, but you're, you've slid right down that slippery slope to say someone's roommate on the basis of a one, two, three-year cohabitation of that home gets to you Sullivan versus Rooney to say, oh, no, i got a piece of this house now. I, I, I just mean that in the bill. I've seen... <laughs> you mean the what... I mean on the bills. If if they leave that apartment, because it's an apartment, probably not a house. If they leave that apartment and the light bill... I don't want it to be an apartment. I want it to be a house. I own a house. Okay, okay I own a house. Yeah. I got to pay my mortgage is two grand a month. P-I-T-I. -I. Yeah. Kelly, you want that extra bedroom and the, the family room? A thousand bucks a month. Split, split these 2,000 month payments with me. She says, yeah, I'll take that. It's a good deal for me. House in the backyard, I can bring my dog in. I said, okay, you can bring your dog in. Makes yourself at home. Three years, all the whole throughout law school. You house are, increases. Uh, month to month lease? Or? No, no, I own the house, but I need someone to share these expenses. But so, is, there is there a rental agreement? Are you making it a rental agreement? We have a handshake. I trust Kelly. Remember? I send her the other clients. <laughs> and so, but, but listen, so three years later, she says, hey, this house has increased a lot in value since I've been here. I, I want half the equity. So what the hell are you, what do you mean? I own this house. Right. Does she tenant. have a claim to my house? No. no. I thought you talked about we, we're in a fiduciary relationship because we're sharing these bills. Absent an agreement, you might be faced with that. I'm not saying it's right, but you might be faced with that. So she can make a claim to my house on the, using Sullivan versus Rooney because you're saying we're in a fiduciary relationship even with no sex. <laughs> Where it gets fuzzy, right there, you just hit the net. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just, Sol 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 Solomon versus Rooney talks about it, right? If this, this is the slope we started down, and this is the slope that, that the student came in and said, you know, really, this happened to me, 
Because the lawyer had said to him, there's no palimony. And there is no palimony in mass. That's a Lee Marvin case, if you, if you ever read it. Michelle Triola wanted half of Lee Marvin's earnings, who was a well-established and successful actor at the time. He's a mass? Huh? California. No, that was in California. This is about this is about constructive trust. She gets it. We're going to go into resulting trust that we have to understand the distinction between constructive and resulting next time we meet.